Greetings friends, Pastor Kyle here and I'm playing Simon Says with some of my pre-K friends at the Early Childhood Center. All right, Simon Says, raise your right hand. Simon Says, put your hand down. Simon Says, raise your left leg. Put your left leg down. Oh, Simon didn't say put it down. All right, Simon Says, put your leg down. All right, Simon Says, turn around and wave at the camera. All right, Simon Says, turn back this way. We're so glad that you're here to worship with us today for our online worship services. We're going to be talking about being a follower, following Jesus, and how we need to watch him closely so that we can do as he calls us to do. And so wherever you are, again, I'm so thankful you've chosen to worship with us today. I invite you to whatever that's been happening this week to let it all go, let it out behind you, breathe in the Spirit of God, and prepare your hearts for an attitude of worship as we now prepare to go live to still our first UMC. All right, Simon says, put your hands together. Simon says, bow your head. Now you can look up. Ah, Simon didn't say. Hey, I didn't look up. <laughs> Good job. and welcome to the Stillwater First United Methodist Church. My name is Pastor Kyle. Whether you're worshiping with us here in this space, joining us via the live radio broadcast or tuning into the YouTube live stream, it is an honor to be worshiping with you today. Today is the second Sunday of Lent, but it's also our third grade Bible Sunday. We've got some wonderful music from children and youth and adults. So we've got a lot going on, so let's go ahead and get started. I invite you to rise and buy your spirit however you're most comfortable as we sing together hymn number 191, Jesus Loves Me.
greeting. As we gather during this sacred season of Lent, we are reminded of the journey towards Easter. A time for reflection, repentance, and renewal. On this Bible Sunday, we celebrate the young members of our community. These Bibles are not just books. They are gateways to the Word of God, providing guidance, wisdom, and a source of strength as they navigate life's paths. To our third graders, as you receive these Bibles, may you discover the timeless truths within its pages and find inspiration to walk in the footsteps of Jesus. We pledge to support and guide each on hearts as they embark on this new chapter of exploration and growth in their faith. You may be seated. Today is a very special day in the life of this congregation, for we have come together to worship God and to present Bibles to our third grade students. So third graders, I invite you to face Pastor Cindy and myself now. And boys and girls, I want you to know that you have reached an important time in your church life. You've heard Bible stories read to you. You've looked at pictures in the Bible, story books. You have memorized Bible verses. And now our church would like to give you a special Bible to read these stories and discover the Christian faith for yourself and to experience the truth revealed in these stories. So we, the congregation, rejoice with you in this special time, and we now pass on to you this valuable treasure. This is a book of 30 centuries. Can you imagine how long 30 centuries is? 3,000 years. Some parts of this book were composed more than a thousand years before Jesus was alive. Some of the stories are so old, they were told before people even knew how to write. Praise God for this ancient treasure, and your response congregation is found in your bulletins. And, this is, and we're going to practice just one time. After Pastor Kyle and I each pause between phrases, your response is, we do praise and thank God for our Bible. Can you say that? We do praise and thank God for our Bible. We refer to our Bible as a treasure because it is a source of truth and guidance for our lives. And even a treasure chest filled with gold cannot buy these things. People have been imprisoned because they read it. Some have even died to save this book. Praise God for this valuable treasure. We do praise and thank God for our Bible. This is a book of stories. Some of the best stories in the world are found in this book. Daniel in the lion's den, Moses receiving the Ten Commandments on the high mountain, Esther saving her people, Mary, Jesus' mother, who obeyed God, 
and the life teachings of Jesus, which in turn teach us how to live our lives. And we will wonder, what did the story mean to the very first people who ever heard it? Why did people think this story was so important that it must be written down? What do the stories mean for your life? Praise God for the stories of faith. We do praise and thank God for our Bible. This is an inspired book. It came from a people who had a unique relationship with God. Therefore, it is not like any other book you will ever own. When you read it, you will understand what God is like and God, what God called you to do. In the Bible, we have a message from God and about God. Praise God for this inspired book. We do praise and thank God for our Bible. Now we pass this treasure on to you. And I want you to know this week our church staff placed their hands upon each of your Bibles and prayed for each one of you that you would treasure God's word as revealed to you through the Bible and that God's word would be a light guiding you along the path of discipleship. Will you step forward as your name is read to receive your very own Bible, a gift from this church family to you? Caden Anderson. Theo Calicote. Avery Fontenier. Charlotte Hayes, and Gideon Mazek. All right, third graders, I've got a few questions for you. Will you read and study the Bible and so learn to become great women and men of God? If so, we say, I will. All right. Will you let God's word teach you how to live? If so, please say, I will. All right. In the congregation, we've got an important question for you as well. Will you as a congregation recommit yourself to the study of God's word so the seed planted in the hearts of these children will grow to bear fruit in the kingdom of God? If so, please answer, we will. We will. Okay, beginning next Sunday, March 3rd, and continuing for four Sundays, Miss Jamie and I will have a Bible study, and we will teach you how to use your Bible. We'll help you to understand how it's ordered, how you can look up verses and stories. We will be teaching you special lessons that will walk you through your Bible, helping you to understand it more clearly. So parents, make sure they come for the next four Sundays, and children, bring your Bibles. Also, did you want to talk about um, know that uh, we also have know that we have a special uh, challenge. Uh, again, we talked about it on Friday night, but I'll remind you once again, be sure to read through that workbook that we've given you and read the scriptures and be sure you're at three of the four Sunday Bible school classes and then you can come and see me. We've got a special t-shirt for you that says, I have a Bible and I know how to use it. And, and also a gift, another special gift for you. So Pastor Cindy and I look forward to hearing about all the things you will learn. And now, Pastor Cindy, can you close us with prayer? Let us pray. Oh God, we thank you for your holy word, which teaches us how to live. We pray that your Holy Spirit will be with these children and transform them through the study of scripture to become the people of God that you have called them to be. Guide us also as we recommit ourselves to read and study your word so that we might live as totally committed disciples of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. In Christ's name we ask this. Amen.
uh, for this morning's children's conversation with Miss Chris to do so now. Okay, what a fun morning, my goodness. Okay, so the third graders received their Bibles today, and that is so exciting, but why is the Bible so important? Look. It tells us about God. Any other answers, Amelia? It lets us remember what God did when he saved us. Thank you. All right. Well, did you know that those are these Bibles are the most important books in the entire world? Did you know that? The, the, the Bible is true, inspired word of God. And so the Apostle Paul describes the word, the words in the Bible as God breathed. So God breathed into the humans that wrote the Bible. And also, when you pick up this book, it's like you're holding a library. Do you know how many books are inside? Gideon knows. <laughs> that was one of his third grade questions. That's right, 66 books in this one Bible. That's right, it was written over a period of time um, by, a, by a number of people. And so in this Bible, you will discover an amazing collection of true real life stories about kings, queens, angels, and there's even a giant in there. There's adventure, there's love, poetry, songs, letters, and even predictions for the future. Best of all, you get to learn about Jesus and the love that he has for us, all of us. And so God speaks to us through this book. So through this book, it's like a guide for us to live. But how cool is it that the God that created the entire universe wants us, wants to talk to us through this book? Let's pray. God, we thank you for the words in this book that teach us to live and love as you would like us to do. Be with the third grade children and all of us as we get to know you better. In your son's name, amen. All right, thank you, kids. Thank you, Miss Chris. A couple of announcements I want to share with you today as part of our discipleship moment is want to, first of all, remind you that we continue our Rise Against Hunger Lenten emphasis. Today is week two of that. Um, we are joining with other United Methodist churches in the area uh, to uh, raise funds, give up something small during the season of Lent, uh, give up that, give up that, uh, that, that, coffee, give up that Sonic run, maybe one meal a week, uh, maybe a night out, uh, and, and the money that you would spend on that, donate to the church, writing Rise Against Hunger on your on the memo line of your check or on the envelope, or for those of you giving remotely, select Rise Against Hunger on the, in the drop-down box. After one week, towards our $20,000 goal, goal, we, along with other area churches, raised just over $2,600. So I'll keep updating you each and every week. Please keep bringing those contributions in each week, and I'll update you on where we are towards that goal. The second thing I want to share with you is very important. You have an insert inside of your bulletin for a worship survey. You were with us back in early January. I shared with you that I have two priorities this year, leadership and worship. And on worship, uh, we know that members of our church, long time, as well as new members of our church, cite that worship is one of our strengths here at Stillwater First UMC. We also don't want to just be content with that. So our worship committee has put together a survey and want to hear from everybody, each and every one of you, whether you're worshiping here in this space, worshiping over the radio, worshiping on YouTube, we want to hear from you. And uh, so this survey will ask, you know, things about, you know, what, what are some of the priorities and the things that you really appreciate about these services? Uh, what are some things that you think could be enhanced? Or is there anything that detracts uh, from your ability to worship God. We know that we can't be all things for all people, but we want to do everything we can to have three distinct services that reach as many people, allowing them an opportunity to offer a sacrifice of worship and praise each day. So you've got a QR code that's up there on the screen. It's also on the insert inside of your bulletin, where you can scan that with your phone or smart device, and that'll take you to a survey. Or you can go to the website, and there's a code there for that as well, that you input that code, and you can fill it out there. Again, this is only going to be helpful if everyone fills that out. If we have a small contingent of people who say, want me to mime my sermons, and that's like the only feedback we get, you know, I would hate to start miming my sermons because it was only the mime contingent that we heard of, okay, you know, for, from, from our worship services. So again, we want to hear from everybody. And if any of you, don't be a smart aleck, don't put mime your sermons on the survey, okay? Like, don't, don't do that now. 
But even if you think to yourself, hey, I, I think worship's great, and I wouldn't really change anything or to de- de- take anything away. You know, there's something to be said about it. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. But it would be helpful for us to hear that as well. So again, please fill that out. If you're worshiping with us online, we'll put this QR code up again during our post-service video. Um, so you can watch this playback, rewind back to this spot. It would be very helpful if, as many of us who are able to and have access to the internet to do this digitally. But I know there may be some of us that do not have access to the internet. So for that reason, we have uh, about 20, 25 hard copy surveys in the back of our worship space that you can pick up on your way out and fill it out and then bring it to our office sometime by end of day, Wednesday, March 6th. For those of you worshiping with us at our faith community at Legacy, uh, if you're watching the TV right now, over to your left on that cabinet, I brought by a stack of hard copy uh, surveys for you. We really want you to participate as well. Feel free to fill those out. Let me know once y'all have done so, and I'll come by and get them you know, here in a couple weeks. So again, thank you so much for helping our worship committee out with this. We look forward to hearing from you, celebrating all the wonderful things that happen here at Stillwater First GMC, and improving upon uh, the ways in which we can. And now, speaking about the wonderful worship that we have, I want to pass things over to Pastor Cindy. Creator God, we do thank you for the world you've created, for the breath of life that you breathed into each one of us, that you would care to give us your written word that becomes your living word as we read it and as you speak to us through its pages. Help us to learn, help us to grow. We give you thanks for your healing grace, your teaching that challenges us, and your call upon our lives. We thank you that what is written in the Gospels and in our hearts is a story of Jesus of Nazareth who invites us to come, who invites us to follow. We pause to pray together this prayer of confession. Gracious God, we come before you today in celebration We proclaim your victory and rejoice in you. We still need help to place you first in our lives. Risen Savior, if we entertain doubts about you, if we neglect to honor you regularly with worship, if we ignore your word and our Bible gathers dust, if we forget to offer prayers daily, forgive us and hear our prayers. We rejoice that in your grace, you offer to forgive us, teach us, lead us, and guide us as we follow you. We thank you for your your Lenten walk through Galilee and through our lives. We thank you for your healing grace. We thank you that what is written in the gospels and in our hearts is your love that is never ending, your love that you desire to live through us, to invite others to come and follow. So together we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen.
Lord, let there be peace in the Sudan. I invite you to join with me as we affirm our faith. We believe in the almighty God, creator of heaven and earth, who in wisdom and love fashioned us in God's likeness. We affirm our faith in Jesus Christ, the son of God, who in obedience to the Father's will endured the wilderness of temptation, triumphing over the powers of darkness. Through his sacrificial love, we find redemption and grace. We confess the presence and guidance of the Holy Spirit who strengthens us in trials and leads us on the path of righteousness. We declare our commitment to follow Christ, to deny ourselves, take up our crosses, and walk in his footsteps. As we navigate this Lenten season, may our lives be a living testimony to the power of God's mercy as we pass on the truth of the gospel. Amen. You may be seated. Pastor Kyle will be speaking to us this morning from the gospel of Luke chapter 5, verses 27 through 32. Jesus had been calling his disciples to follow him, had worked a couple of miracles, and we come to this verse. After this, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he got up, left everything, and followed him. Then Levi gave a great banquet for him in his house. There was a large crowd of tax collectors and others sitting at the table with them. The Pharisees and their scribes were complaining to his disciples, saying, why do you eat and drink with the tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners to repentance. This is the word of the Lord to live and to share. Thanks be, be to, to God. God. I found myself thinking about driver's ed this past week. It, it was on purpose. I wasn't just waxing nostalgic about younger years or anything like that. But 
I, I was thinking about driver's ed. Uh, it, where I went to school, they offered driver's education every summer, and it was taught by one of the football coaches. And uh, so I was 15. You know, a couple months later, I'd be trying to get my driver's permit, and then that net following spring, would be trying to get my driver's license when I turned 16. And, and I'm sure that I learned a lot of great stuff and internalized a lot of what they had to say because as you can ask my wife, Heather, I'm an impeccable driver. But, but, but I, I, there's only really one lesson that really stood out to me that I still remember to this day. I remember our instructor was talking about when you're, you know, you're driving at night and sometimes there may be someone who's in the other lane you know, coming towards you and maybe they, you, know, you want to get their attention. Maybe it looks like they're not quite staying in their lane. Maybe they have their high beams on. And traditionally, the common practice is you flash your, your, your brights at them. You flash your headlights. But he told us, he said, don't do that more than once. And he explained to us, he said, say that individual, their senses are impaired for one reason or another. And you start flashing your brights at them. What are you doing? You're gathering, you're gaining their attention. And now they're looking at your flashing headlights and you don't want that to happen because people drive where they are looking. And it was that statement that stood out to me. People drive in the direction they're looking. And this past week, I found myself remembering that and thinking about that. And I thought, now, is that just like some folksy wisdom from an old football coach? Or is that like real, a real thing? And so I was searching online. And I found a lot of articles. I found a number of other driver's education curriculum that says it's a proven fact that human nature is to drive where you are looking. And that's why it's so important that, yes, you should be scanning the horizon and in front of you. And, but generally, your eyes should be forward. Because if you spend too much time looking at that person sitting next to you, looking at some object in the distance, or looking at your dials and your buttons or your phone, there's a tendency that you're going to begin to drive in the direction that you're looking. And I thought, well, how is that so much like our faith as well? That we as a people of faith have to stop and ask ourselves, where are we focusing? Where are we looking? Yes, we as a people of faith, we know where to keep our eyes and our attention upon Jesus, but how often are there other things Wealth, power, pleasure, influence, any number of th items and people and things that might begin to d attract us, distract us. And as we keep our eyes on those things, pull us off of the path or the road of discipleship. So that's what we're going to talk about just a little bit today. Today is a, uh, our second sermon in our Lenten sermon series, Pass on the Truth, where we're doing a deep dive into the Gospel of Luke, and we're both experiencing, receiving the truth of the Gospel for ourselves, so that then we'll be prepared to then pass on the good news of the risen Christ come Easter. So let's look at the story of Jesus calling Levi, and as we begin, let's do so with a word of prayer. Gracious loving God, we do give you thanks for this opportunity we have to come together to fellowship with one another and to worship you. It is my prayer, O oh Lord, that we might remain focused upon you. Help us to do so by descending your presence down upon us, whether we're worshiping here in this space or worshiping remotely. Unite us by your Holy Spirit. Fill me with your spirit. Use me as a vessel. Speak through me to share with each of us your message of truth and grace this day. Amen. So Jesus walks up to a tax booth, and that may sound like the intro to a corny joke, I, it, it's not, I, but, but I do want to point out just a couple of things for you. First of all, remember how tax collectors were viewed during Jesus' time. Tax collectors are individuals uh, of Jewish people who have decided or have chosen to help the Roman Empire to collect taxes amongst their community, amongst their brothers and sisters, their family, their, their neighbors, and they often are getting rich off of doing so. So tax collectors are not well thought of. And then if either as you read this, this scripture this past week as part of our Lenten readings, or when you heard it, Pastor Cindy read it, if you found yourself thinking to yourself, hold on a second, I swear I've heard this story before, it was about someone named Matthew, and they went on to write the Gospel of Matthew, know that yes, you're correct. Levi and Matthew are one and the same. Uh, Levi is his Hebrew or Jewish name, Matthew is his Greek name which would make sense that if you're a Jewish person, you have your Jewish name, but also if you're accustomed to doing business with Romans who speak and write in Greek, you would also have a Greek name as well. So that's where that comes from. But Luke refers to Matthew or Levi by his Jewish name. So Jesus approaches the tax booth of Levi, who's there collecting taxes. And you can imagine that some of the disciples he's already called, Peter, James, and John, others who are following with him, they're probably thinking to themselves, oh, he is going to get it. You know, Jesus is going to give this dirty, good-for-nothing tax collector a tongue lashing. You know, what, what, do you, what do you think he's going to say? What do you think he's going to say? Oh, maybe he's going to tell him, he's going he's to call him a traitor. You know, you betrayed your people. Or, no, 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 no. Maybe he'll say, if you love Rome so much, why don't you move there? Or, or no, 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 I got it. This is what he's going to say. 
I bet your mother's real proud of you. <laughs> you know, like, I, I just imagine the disciples as a play, like, there's this hush that comes over them, like, let's hear it, let's see what he has to say. And Jesus walks up to this tax booth. He looks at Levi in the eyes, this man who is, like, bottom row of society. And Jesus says, follow me. I imagine there had to be a gasp amongst the others. <gasps> what? Did he just say what I thought he said? Surely he's joking, right? Like, like he wants him to be with us? I, I appreciate what other pastors and authors have, have written about this moment, that this call from Jesus to somebody to follow him. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Michael Bowie uh, writes that Jesus you know, doesn't have a strategic plan. <laughs> he just has an invitation. Follow me. Uh, Pastor and author Andy Stanley, uh, speaking on this, he, he says he, he's intrigued by what Jesus doesn't say in this moment. Jesus doesn't approach Levi and say, if you'll do blank, come and follow me. If you'll start doing X, if you'll stop doing Y, here's this checklist. And once you have completed all these, tasks, I'll, all these tasks, I'll come back in a week. And if you've done them, then you can follow me. No, Jesus simply looks at Levi and says, follow me. Now imagine for a moment how that feels as Levi. Levi, who, because of his own choices, he's an outcast from society. As people are forced to pay the tolls and the taxes that are required, they, they look at him with contempt and disdain and anger. Imagine how he probably feels on the inside. He's getting rich. But the people he's hurting in the process and taking advantage of. And now comes this rabbi that word has begun to spread about who has these amazing teachings, is performing these unbelievable miracles. And he's walking up to Levi, and you can imagine, he's probably thinking to himself, oh no, what's he going to say to me in front of all these people? And Jesus looks at him, as probably nobody's looked at him in a long time, with care and compassion, and says, follow me. I want to associate with you. I want you to be my people. I want you to be part of my family. Do, do you want to associate with us? Do you want to come and follow me? I mean, no wonder Levi drops everything and follows him, right? <laughs> As he probably sees in Jesus a, care, a depth of care and compassion that only Jesus could offer, and he probably hasn't received in so long. And then the story gets better from there. Actually, probably worse if you're Peter, James, and John and the other disciples. Because now they've got this tax collector who's following with them. And that's bad enough. But then Levi says, hey, I want to throw a banquet at my house. <laughs> and, and Jesus, I, I want to invite you and your friends, your disciples. Let's, let's go to my house for a banquet. And I can imagine the disciples saying, whoa, 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 whoa. Like, like we, we, we've, he's now with us. That's bad enough for him to be associated with us. We can't be seen going into his home and eating with him. And he's inviting all his friends. Do you know what kind of friends tax collectors have? More tax collectors. Like, that's the only people who want to associate with them. In fact, when you read in the scriptures, you often, they're always tied together with what else? You know, it's tax collectors and sinners. Like, you know, that's how bad it is. Like, sinners don't even want to be associated with tax collectors. Like, we need another category here. Like, like I'm a sinner, but at least I'm not a tax collector. Like, come on, let's be honest with each other. And so, but they go to this house, and, and Jesus is there, he's eating, and they're, they're, they're fellowshipping together, and, and the Pharisees and the scribes, the religious leaders and authorities at this time, they see what's going on. Maybe they've seen Jesus and his followers enter the house. Maybe Matthew's house, or Levi's house is like one of those wealthy houses of the day that they often had like an open courtyard in the front facing the street. And that's where they would host their banquets, and they would have their big meals, and so maybe, you know, they can all kind of see inside what's going on, but... Something happens, and, and one of the disciples, let's say Peter, maybe they're walking in and out. Maybe Peter had to step outside to get some fresh air from all the tax collector cooties or something. But, he's, but, but, but Peter stepped outside, and one of the Pharisees, let's say, grabs him and says, What are you all doing? Why are you, why is he eating with sinners and tax collectors? You hear the insinuation, right? Like, this is supposed to be some holy man. You're supposed to be some holy people, and you're with them? And I don't know what happens next. I don't know if Peter then goes inside and, like, asks Jesus this question. Or I don't know if it is, like, an open courtyard and Jesus can hear what's being asked out there. And so maybe he just hollers it, you know. But Jesus goes ahead and answers the question. He didn't let his disciple do it. Like, he does it for himself. He says, you know, the, the healthy or the well are not in need of a physician. It's the sick. I came to call not the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. 
I mean, imagine, you know, we've all heard this before, right? That Jesus came not for the healthy, but for the sick. He came not for the righteous, but for sinners, you know, to save us from our sins. We, we've all heard that before. But imagine you're there hearing this. Like you're Levi, or you're one of Levi's tax collector friends. Like at first they're probably like, yeah, Jesus, you tell those Pharisees. Wait a minute. <laughs> did, you, did you say we're sick? <laughs> like what, like what, are you, what are you saying here, Jesus? You're, you're telling us that, that we're not well, that there's something wrong with us? What are you, what are you trying to say? And. You know, Jesus, he's, he is full of grace and forgiveness and love. But to authentically be those things, you have to also be honest and truthful, especially with yourself. And, and Luke stops the story there. We don't know what comes next, but I can imagine if there's a conversation. If Levi's like, Jesus, what do you mean? You're calling us sick? I can imagine Jesus, with grace and love, in the way that only he can, saying, Levi... You're getting rich off of the poor, <laughs> and you're getting wealthy and taking advantage of your neighbors. Do you think that's spiritually healthy? As I look at the scripture today, as we seek to learn the truth from the gospel of Luke and how we can, can experience it and then carry it on, I, I hear a couple things. I hear that Jesus is called to us. We often make it more complicated than it is. I mean, Jesus is just saying, look, just follow me. Focus on me. Walk towards me. Look at my life. Look at the love that I have to offer. Walk my footsteps. Live as I live. Love as I love. But also to do so requires us to look inside a little bit as well. And for each and every one of us to acknowledge we've got sin in our lives. We're not all spiritual health, spiritually healthy. And the one cure is to draw closer to follow more closely with Jesus so that his grace, his forgiveness, his love, his example might rub off on us. And just a little bit more every day, we'll become more and more like him. That's one of the truths we celebrate this Lent as we move towards Easter. But of course, as I said, it's also our calling to pass it on. We're called to pass on that truth. We're, we're called to call other people to follow Jesus, to encourage and strengthen others who, who, like Levi, have that feeling inside of them that there's something out there that's calling upon them, that's pulling upon them to dedicate their lives to something greater than themselves, to something of eternal significance. And, and we're called to do that as well. Otherwise, if we say, well, I'm just going to hang out with the people who behave like me and believe like me and all the right things, we're going to find ourselves like the Pharisees, standing outside and looking in on the very room where Jesus is. So we have to be willing to not only wel welcome and experience this truth, but then to pass it on and to call others to experience it as well. And that's a big part of what today is about, third grade Bible Sunday. We as a church have passed on Bibles to our third grade children so that they might read the scriptures. They might come to know the good news of Jesus, that they one day might realize that, hey, I'm not perfect either. And then they can then work on themselves as they begin to follow more and more closely with Jesus and allow his teachings to flow over them, to pour over them. And we're telling you, i got to tell you, we need your help with this. <laughs> I mean, I as a pastor, Miss Chris, our church staff, we're going to do everything we can for these children, but we need your help as well. And I'm also telling you this selfishly as the parent of one of those third graders who was up here earlier. I mean, we all know how this works, right? Kids don't listen to their parents. Like, I mean, like I, we've all experienced this before, right? Like, you can tell your kids something a dozen times, and then they'll come back, and they'll say, hey, did you know what so-and-so told me? You know, there'll be some other adult in their life who they care for and they trust. More importantly, they know, loves, and cares for and pours into them. And they'll say, did you know what they said? And you'll say, yeah, I've been trying to tell you that for years now. We had another, I had a parent tell me this exact same thing last night. They said, my kids seem to not want to learn anything from me. Like, you know, they're happy to learn from other adults, but not from me. That's why we need you. We need you to pour into the children in your family and the children of this church, the children of God of all ages beyond the walls of this church so that they can see in you faithful adults who seek to follow Jesus. Because yes, research tells us that we drive where we're looking. But research also tells us that we follow the gaze of those we're watching. And so as you start to look somewhere else, as you begin to follow Jesus, we tend to look and to see where are they looking, what are they looking at, and what might it have in store for me. They've done research on this. New York City, one of those busy, stereotypical streets. And when someone stops and looks up 
and just stands there for a while. They watch and notice as people begin to stop and look as well. Like, what are you looking at? Found as they increase their numbers. One person, two person, three, maybe five people just standing there and looking. And they'll find that the crowds get bigger. And even if it's just for a moment, people stop and say, what are you looking at? May it be the same with our lives. May the children and the people of this church, may the people of this community and beyond see in us a group of people who are so with our words, our actions, our very lives, so obviously focused in and devoted to Jesus Christ that they can't help but stop and look to Jesus as well. So let us each seek to answer, start by answering that question. Make it simple for ourselves. We don't have to ask ourselves, how many times have I been to church this month? Did I give a full tithe? Have I read my Bible today? How much have I spent in prayer? I mean, these are all important questions, but let's just simplify it. Ask yourself today, am I following? With my words, with my actions, with my life, am I following? Our children and the world is watching how we will answer that question. Are we following? Amen. Word of God, we give you thanks and praise. We celebrate the gift of the Sabbath, the gift of your scripture made available today, and for your church teaching children about your amazing love. Thank you for reshaping our lives through your word and our time together with you. Amen. That is our hope and prayer that the word of God revealed to us through the Holy Scriptures might shape, transform each and every one of our lives. And maybe part of that call that you're experiencing today, am I following? Am I following in the footsteps of Christ? Maybe for you the best way to answer that question is by following Christ into a family of faith. A place where you can experience the encouragement and the love and the joy of God. Where you might encourage others and strengthen them on their journey as well. If that's the case, know that we'd love to talk to you about joining the Stillwater First United Methodist Church. I invite you to see myself, Pastor Kyle, before you leave today, or Pastor Cindy, or leave a message there on our YouTube page. Give us a call, send us an email, let us know. We would love to have a time to get together with you and talk about what it looks like to follow Jesus here through the Stillwater First United Methodist Church. And with that in mind, I invite you to rise and by your spirit, however you're most comfortable, as we sing our closing hymn, number 672, verses 1 through 3, of God be with you till we meet again.
Whether you're worshiping with us here in this space, whether you're worshiping with us remotely, I pray that until we meet again, each of us will go forth in the strength and the power of God to not only receive that good news, but then to share it with the world, our children, but children of God of all ages, until all come to know the goodness, the grace, the love, the peace that only God can provide. Go forth in peace. Amen. to once more thank you for coming and joining us for worship online today if you haven't done so yet i'd invite you to take some time to put your name and and where you're worshiping from in the comments section check out our website at fumcstw.org where you can learn more about our missions and ministries and how you can support god's kingdom work through stillwater first umc and i really do hope that you will take the time to fill out that worship survey survey once again uh, you can find that qr code right here scan that and you can fill out that survey. We'd love to know what your worship experience is like as someone who worships with us online. Once again, also, if there's any way I can be of assistance to you, uh, be of service to you, be your pastor, don't hesitate to reach out to me at kanderson at fumcstw.org. I'd love to be in contact with you. And until next week, feel free, and I hope that you find ways to both experience and then pass on the truth of God's goodness. See you soon.